Support comes from Bellingham's Whatcom Museum, the Pacific Northwest host for National Geographic's greatest wildlife photographs, iconic images, and behind-the-scenes videos on view through September 8th. More info at whatcommuseum.org. Support comes from ArchBright, offering virtual and in-person training on supervision, management, communication, and collaboration. Available for individual enrollment or as private team trainings. Details at archbright.com. You are entitled to nothing. America was built on the spirit of industry. You build your future. It isn't handed to you. To many, the idea of giving free money with no strings attached to people in need cuts against the most fundamental American values. It's called universal basic income, and even though it's controversial, it's being put to the test all across the country, especially here in Washington. It felt like winning the lottery, really. It's easy to understand why the policy is popular with people who receive the money. Uh, it's, it's just, life is brighter. But what's in it for everyone else? I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich! From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Monica Nicholsberg. And I'm Joshua McNichols. Today, I spoke with organizer Natalie Foster to hear the case for giving some people free money and how it could solve one of the most stubborn problems in our economy today. That's coming up in a few minutes. But first, Joshua, what are you working on? Well, this Friday is the anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. You know, that's when a neighborhood in Tulsa, nicknamed Black Wall Street, was destroyed by members of an armed white mob. The relevance here in Seattle is that business owners here are marking the anniversary. They're gathering together. They're talking about it. And I spoke to a black business owner named Monica Thornton Lawrence. I think for us, that was an eye opener. Even in my generation, I'm still trying to take it all in that so many amazing black business owners lost what they worked so hard for. There were neighborhoods full of black owned businesses all over the country that have shrunk or faded, including in Seattle. Would that be the Central District? Yes. The black population there has shrunk from 90 percent in the 1960s to 9 percent today. That happened for less violent reasons, you know, mostly economic forces. And after 1968, black households could no longer be excluded from housing in other neighborhoods. But I learned something new about the Tulsa massacre this week. Three years after that neighborhood was torn down, it rebuilt stronger than it was before. And today there's this nationwide movement to rebuild or revive black business districts, including here in Seattle. Is it working? Because, I don't know, 90 percent to 9 percent is a huge drop. Well, there's a long way to go, but it's still caught people's attention here, like business owner Maisha Russell. Give me hope. Give me drive. Give me a reason to keep going, to know that we have people that's backing us, that we have a community, too. I'm going to get emotional, but it, it, it just gives you hope. I love how much optimism you can hear in her voice. And actually, economic resilience in communities of color is something we're going to get into a little bit later. But in the meantime, I'm looking forward to your reporting on this. All right. Well, it's already up on KOW.org. Oh, (laughs) I need to go read it then. Okay, coming up, a surprising answer to the labor shortage that's gaining momentum. That's after the break. Support comes from ArchBright, offering virtual and in-person training on supervision, management, communication, and collaboration. Available for individual enrollment or as private team trainings. Details at archbright.com. Support comes from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, where collaboration between clinicians and researchers gives patients advanced, personalized treatments for their cancer. This relationship can help make life beyond cancer a reality. Learn more at fredhutch.org. Look beyond. So, Monica, I know today we're talking about universal basic income. Can you just lay out what does that mean? Yeah, for sure. It means basically no strings attached, regular cash payments to people in need. We should probably note that it's not actually universal in any of the examples that we're going to talk about today. Some UBI diehards want cash payments for every family, or at least every family that's not making a certain amount already. But usually these pilots target specific populations, like people struggling with basic things, paying bills, keeping a roof over their head. 
students working multiple jobs, single mothers, you know, you get the idea. Yeah. Tacoma has been experimenting with this. In their first basic income pilot, they gave everyone who participated $500 a month for a year, and they could do whatever they wanted with the money. I talked to Stephanie Bartella, who went through the program. I actually first heard about it via a post on Facebook that a friend of mine posted. At the time, she was considering getting a second job, which felt like a huge step backward after everything that she'd been through. Stephanie had left what she described to me as an unsafe marriage with her four kids, and she finished her degree, she got an entry-level job at Pierce College, and she made this really detailed financial plan for her family. But at the end of the day, she still had to put the utilities bill on her credit card. It felt really defeating because, like, the feedback I was getting was like, hey, you are doing the right things. And I'm like, but it's still not working. So... How did things change once she started getting free money through this pilot program? At first, in the way you might expect, you know, she paid off credit card bills and debt. But then eventually the money let her think about other needs in her life. She got her some braces. She described this rotting tree in her yard that she had removed. And she went on a road trip with her kids. She was also just able to focus on the one job that she had instead of trying to get a second one. And she got a promotion. And even though she's not getting that $500 a month anymore, she can afford to pay her bills without racking up debt now. So does she actually credit the extra money with getting her that promotion? Yeah, she does. She says that the money got her out of panic mode. She didn't have to think about finding a second job and she could just focus on making the most of the opportunity that she had in front of her. Okay, so it sounds like it was great for her. You know, as a policy, though, this idea of universal basic income, it, it kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. I mean, I know we heard about it during Andrew Yang's presidential campaign. When you hear uh, me say, hey, everyone gets a thousand bucks a month, you're like, wow, that sounds too good to be true. But where did this idea come from? Yeah, I think it does feel that way to a lot of people, but it actually has roots in the civil rights movement. Buckle in for a quick history lesson. <laughs> in the past, we've attached a lot of strings to welfare. People who are getting help can be subject to home inspections, work requirements, just a lot of hurdles to prove that they're quote unquote deserving of the money. That led to a lot of racial discrimination. And in the 60s, a group of black mothers started advocating for welfare reform. They were super effective and they actually convinced Martin Luther King Jr. to take up the issue. Now one of the answers, it seems to me, is a guaranteed annual income, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. I had no idea this started with Martin Luther King. Yeah, most people don't. <laughs> but I I don't hear this part of his story very often. So, I mean, I'm assuming that it didn't really take off. No, it didn't. But it is gaining steam today. A few weeks ago, I covered a basic income pilot here in King County. And one of the findings was really surprising. Those monthly cash payments made people a lot more likely to get a job by the end of the pilot. I wanted to understand why, so I sat down with Natalie Foster. Her nonprofit, the Economic Security Project, has spearheaded more than 130 of these basic income pilots across the country. She was behind the pilot in Tacoma that Stephanie participated in, and Tacoma just started a second version of that program. Natalie worked on President Obama's campaign and for the progressive nonprofit MoveOn.org, and she just published a book about her work, The Guarantee, Inside the Fight for America's Next Economy. I think there's a part of all of us that is resistant to the idea of just giving somebody money because you don't know how they're going to spend it. It's the reason that some people might prefer to donate money to a nonprofit that helps people living with homelessness rather than just giving cash to somebody on the street. What is the benefit of not attaching any strings to this kind of income? The benefit of not attaching any strings is that people can make their own choices for what works in their life and that everyone's life is fundamentally different. And frankly, it changes week to week, month to month. The transmission goes out in the car it's got to get fixed so you can get to work. You need to work extra hours. You have then extra child care costs. It changes month to month and week to week. And people know what they need. People are the best arbiters of their own financial lives. And we should trust them. You know, we've learned some interesting things about the kind of impact that these pilots giving people 
a lump sum once a month can have. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you learned from the basic income pilot that you helped craft in Tacoma and if it's kind of consistent with what you've seen in other programs across the country. Yeah, I was really excited when the Guaranteed Income Program took off in Tacoma and was excited to see, you know, the results that people, when they received $500 a month with no strings attached, that they secured better paying jobs, they reduced their debts and increased their savings. And people reported feeling overall less stress, less anxiety, pain, fatigue, all of the symptoms that come with poverty and with um, not knowing how you're going to pay rent uh, and put food on the table. So the results were exactly what you'd imagine, frankly, when people have economic security. And they are very similar to the results we're seeing across the country with other guaranteed income pilots. Yeah, I mean, I I'm of two minds about this because I can see how as somebody who's steeped in this work, that is sort of what you'd expect. But I actually think it's kind of surprising to a lot of folks. You know, King County just published the results from a separate basic income pilot. And there was one outcome that really stood out to a lot of people. The $500 a month appeared to help participants land jobs and better wages, like you mentioned in the Tacoma pilot. Their employment jumped from 37 percent to 66 percent, which is almost double by the end of this pilot. And I actually think that's counterintuitive to a lot of folks. You know, why would free money make you more likely to get a job? I do think you're right that it's counterintuitive. Um, Early on, the critics were saying, you know, people are just going to stop working. But the fact of the matter is when people have space in their life to invest in themselves, they're able to find and secure a higher paying job or a job that fits into their life or a job that is more meaningful to them. Um, perhaps one that ends at three o'clock so they can go pick up their kid from school, the simple things that actually make a huge difference in people's lives. So it was surprising to me as well. But as I've dug in, it's not surprising at all that when you are working two or three jobs to make ends meet, it is almost impossible to see what is beyond what's right in front of you. Can you give me an example? Like, say I'm a person who has been struggling for one reason or another to get a job, how having $500 a month could make it easier for me to get that job? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you the story of a woman I met in Jackson, Mississippi, and she was one of the early recipients of Dr. Aisha Yandaro's Magnolia Mother's Trust, which was one of the very earliest modern guaranteed income pilots. It's the longest running in the country. And Dr. Aisha Yandaro centers black women in her pilot and gives $1,000 a month to black women living in Georgia. And this woman I met, she was uh, sitting across the table from me and talked about how she had worked her minimum wage job, but her dream was to be a phlebotomist. What is a phlebotomist? A phlebotomist, yes. Uh, I can't spell it, (laughs) but I can define it. It's drawing blood. And she had been going to the community college to get her phlebotomy certificate and uh, had fallen behind on tuition by $300 because of a car emergency that she'd had. So she'd put that dream on hold because she didn't have $300 to go in and pay for that tuition. And she got the first Magnolia Mother's Trust check. She walked down to the community college. She paid the $300. She re-enrolled in her phlebotomy classes and then went to the market, bought some groceries, and went home. And she is now a phlebotomist. Like That is an example of what it means to be able to invest in yourself, pursue a dream, and find meaningful work when you have just a little bit more breathing room. Yeah, when you explain it like that, It's clear to see how a little bit of extra money could help you overcome these obstacles to getting a job or a better paying job that many of us don't think about who are a little bit more comfortable. But didn't the opposite happen during the pandemic? You know, we constantly heard nobody wants to work anymore because they got this free money in the form of stimulus checks. And that supposedly led to this labor shortage that we're still dealing with today. Is that true? That is what we heard in the beginning. And there were, in fact, a lot of people quitting their jobs. And people were able to do that because they had a little bit more money in their pockets. But what was also important at that time is that hires were bigger than quits. 
-hmm. Nicole Mason, who is a, a leader in this space, framed it, really, it's the great renegotiation, not the great resignation. People were resigning, but then people were finding jobs at higher pay. That's also the period of time we saw wages go up because of the tight labor market. And so people were renegotiating their relationship to the labor market and finding work that was more suitable for them. And I think that period of time is when we saw more worker agency than I have maybe in my lifetime. And if we were to adopt a guaranteed income more broadly, do you think we would see the same kind of thing, maybe some short-term pain and reshuffling? Possibly. I think people would have the power to say no to a job that didn't pay enough to an abusive relationship. There would be more economic security and power that comes from that. But people would also have the power to say yes. One of the other things we saw during the pandemic that flew in the face of how trends had been prior is small business creation. For decades, small business creation has gone down in America as corporate consolidation has gotten deeper, as you know, monopolies have gotten bigger, it is just harder than ever to be a mom and pop business in this country, which is something that is should be of great concern to many of us and people across all political stripes. And um, in the pandemic, we saw small business creation go up 24% in 2021 and in 2022. And it is, I believe, partly because people had more money in their pockets and were able to build on some dream that they'd had to start a food truck to open up a hair salon, the different dreams people have um, for their lives. Yeah, I mean, you paint a very optimistic vision of this sort of grand experiment with a universal basic income that we tried during the pandemic with these stimulus checks. But what do you say to people who are still dealing with inflation, who say, we pumped all this money into the economy and prices went up at record rates and that hurts everybody? Yeah, inflation is a real problem. And we know that it hurts the lowest income earners the most. And look, I'd say inflation is caused by a number of things, largely the historic um, supply chain crisis, the shutting down and opening up of COVID and the war in the Ukraine, all of which came together to create bottlenecks. The way we handle inflation is by making sure people who are the lowest income earners have more money in their pockets. And that is exactly what things like the expanded child tax credit did in this country. For six months, every parent in America got a check with no strings attached. There was no line to stand in, no inspection in your home, no form to fill out. You just got the check. If you have two small kids, it could be four or $500. Um, so it was meaningful money in people's lives. And that is what is needed to weather periods like the inflationary one in which we're in. I want to talk about the child tax credit because that was a policy you actually worked on, right? Yeah, was very excited to see that policy pass. And I think there is a direct line to the pilots that were demonstrating what it would look like to give people money in their communities. Um, you know, because I've lived through another economic crisis in 2008, and that's not what we did. We did not send people tax. In fact, we left Americans out to dry. Right During that period, 10 million Americans would lose their home. Black and Latino families would lose half their collective wealth. And we would shore up the banks. This time around, we did something very different. And the expanded child tax credit is one of the investments we made in helping people get through this period of time. For every $1 that were sent to families, there was an $8 return in social and economic benefit to society. People spent the money in their towns and their communities. They spent the money on groceries and on rent. And it was important to local communities to have. Yeah, that policy is really interesting to me because it's such a departure from history in a number of ways. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about how the welfare programs, the government assistance programs that we do have they face so much resistance to getting past. And it seems like it takes some big social upheaval to actually get them across the finish line. Like the Great Depression gave us Social Security, for example. That's right. 
But once you do pass them, they become very popular and it's hard to claw them back. That's not exactly what happened with the child tax credit. You know, it passed during the pandemic, which felt like maybe it was another one of these big moments when we were going to adopt really, you know, sweeping anti-poverty policies. But it was written with an expiration date and it wasn't renewed. Why has it gotten so much harder to pass these kinds of anti-poverty moonshots? Mm. That is a question I feel like I ask myself every day. Here's a couple of things we learned. One is that six months is not enough time to truly become part of the social contract and to counter decades of what we've told people they deserve. And the story we've told people, which is that the markets will solve our problems, that government should get out of the way, and that it's your job to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That is the American story we've told. And a new story is forming, but it takes a while to both form and for people to feel it in their lives. And it turns out six months in the middle of a pandemic is not enough time. I am confident, however, that it will pass eventually. And here's why. We have seen the number of states double uh, that have passed a an expanded child tax credit since the original one passed. At the state level At versus the state the level. That's exactly right. They're red states, blue states, purple states, and I'm hopeful that we'll triple the number of states. So the momentum is still there. It's just not happening inside of a broken and deeply divided and partisan Washington, D.C. Yeah, let's... Let's talk about that American story that you mentioned, the sort of bootstrap mythology, because I do think that for a lot of Americans, it's a it's a core value that you work for everything that you have. And that's one of the reasons there's so much resistance to the idea of a guaranteed basic income or minimum income. What do you say to people who really deeply believe that if the government's going to help you out, it should come with work requirements or strings or, you know, other checks and balances on that money? Mm. I would say that the best way to support people who work and to support work in America is by investing in the foundations people need to work. It's incredibly important that we have a guaranteed income so that people can invest in themselves and their job and their work. That's the way we can strengthen work in America. Because right now what we have is Americans working incredibly hard, but the economy not working for them. People have two, sometimes three jobs to put food on the table and a minimum wage that has stayed, you know, $7.25 for a very long time, despite your best efforts here in Seattle to kick off (laughs) the fight for 15, which was really historic. These policies that we've been talking about I think we'll still feel pretty radical to a lot of people. I understand that. But the truth is the guarantees are foundational to the way we do business in America. They're foundational to corporate America. If you are running a business, you have the guarantee of the monetary system, the patent system, the court system. Shareholders have liability guarantees so they aren't personally liable for corporate activity. Guarantees make business possible in America. And I'm just arguing we should extend them to everyday people who make this economy run. Okay, well, even if you get folks on board ideologically for these kinds of policies, what about the cost? Obviously, if you're giving everyone free money, it's got to come from somewhere. What do you think is the most realistic way to fund basic income programs? Well, the same way we fund anything that we care about in the United States of America, which has no trouble finding money for things it cares about, whether it be uh, foreign policy or manufacturing chips right here in the United States, because we understand it's a national security concern and one that's important to the future of work. And so we're going to do that in a bipartisan way, right? There is money for the things we care about. And there's no shortage of ways you could generate income, things like a financial transaction tax, right, which is a small fee 
on high frequency trading that would result in billions of dollars a year. There is idea after idea after idea like that sitting on shelves in think tanks. We just have to have the political will to do it. And we've talked about how that political will often comes from these big social dislocation events like the Great Depression or the pandemic. I'm curious if you think we could be at the outset of another tipping point with the artificial intelligence revolution. If millions of Americans find themselves out of a job, could that be the moment when we embrace basic income more broadly? I certainly hope so. I I do think uh, we live in the age of chaos. You're talking about chaos in the workforce, and it is something I think a lot about. I don't think AI will come in and take jobs. I think it will shift jobs. And there will be more jobs created. But historically, we know when more jobs are created, they aren't necessarily good jobs. They're often piecemeal. They're often gig jobs, jobs that people have to work two or three of in order to make ends meet. And so we do need to um, make a different choice, one, in how we think about work and jobs. And we also need to invest in a floor, not a ceiling, a floor, so people can weather those crises. But I don't think it's just AI, right? We live in a moment where there's climate chaos all around us. California could erupt in flames at any point. Texas could freeze over. Uh, Those things are happening. And so I think resilience, economic resilience, should be something we take very seriously in the 21st century. Natalie Foster is an organizer. She is the co-founder of the Economic Security Project and the author of the new book, The Guarantee, Inside the Fight for America's Next Economy, which covers all of these ideas and the age of chaos. Natalie, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been fascinating. It was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm hearing from all this is that, you know, basically evidence is fairly clear that this works for the people who are in it. But what's in it for everybody else? What's in it for everyone else is the multiplier effect that these kinds of programs can have. They make it more likely for somebody to get a job or get a better paying job. And that means that they'll have more money to spend on goods and services and create that economic activity that we're always looking for. They might also start a business, like Natalie said, and that creates more jobs for other people. So it's this idea that giving people a little bit of short-term help might make them less likely to rely on the government in the long term and might make the economy healthier overall for all of us. All right, coming up next, the end game. So Joshua... We've been talking a lot about economic security and what it actually costs to live a decent life. Uh And that is the subject of our endgame. But we're going to make it fun. Okay. (laughs) So a couple of weeks ago, this study came out from Smart Asset, which is a financial advice site, on the income needed for a family of four to live comfortably in each state. Okay. Did you see it? No, I didn't see it. Great. Okay. You won't be able to cheat. (laughs) Not that I would accuse you of that. Okay. So it uses the 50-30-20 budget for a family of four. Are you trying to budget this year? I've got you. Try the 50-30-20 rule. This means that 50% of your money goes towards essentials. Things like your house, your groceries, utilities, that kind of stuff. 30% should go towards fun. This is where you get to enjoy your money, eating out, shopping, and 20% goes towards your future. This is stuff like retirement and emergency savings and paying down debt. Follow for more tips. So following that criteria, what do you think a family of four, two parents, two kids, living in Washington would need to live comfortably? Okay, so I'm going to assume their rent is, you know, they're renting and they need a lot of bedrooms. So Unfortunately, maybe $3,000 for that. Uh, And then bills, you know, maybe another $500 at least. So um, and then savings, assuming they're able to do that, that's another, um, let's see, 20% of like 35. I don't know. It's too much math for me, but I'm just going to throw another like uh, $500 at that. And then, um, you know, say they want to go out for some movies or something. We're getting to $5,000 a month at least. Okay, so I need an annual number because I did not sign up to do math as part of this game. Okay, so 5,000 times 12 is uh, 60,000. That is not correct. Is that your final answer? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you told I, obviously like people are hurting, so it's got to be way higher. So you're asking me what kind of income you need in Washington to survive, and I know so, no, not to survive, to live comfortably. To live comfortably, I know sixty thousand is way too low. Like in Seattle, you've got to have double digit incomes in your household. You got to have at least a hundred thousand. So in Washington State, I bet it's a little bit lower. So I'm going to say like ninety thousand. You ready for the answer? Okay. The answer is two hundred and fifty-seven thousand in what? annual income. <laughs> yeah, that is essentially sixty dollars an hour per person. Total of one hundred and twenty-three dollars per hour. Who makes sixty dollars an hour? Well, I know like lawyers and stuff, but this is just if you want to have the gold standard of financial wellness, how much your family would need to earn. And to put this in the context of the conversation we've been having, Washington State's minimum wage is about $16 an hour. So if you had two people making minimum wage, they'd need to work 152 hours a week oh my each word. <laughs> to make that annual income, which obviously is basically all of the hours in a week. You would not be able to sleep or do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're just not comfortable in this state. Nobody is comfortable. <laughs> or I guess a small handful of people probably are, but most are not. Yeah. What do you think is the most expensive state for a family of four to live comfortably in? Um, I'm going to guess California. Nope, it's Massachusetts. You would have to have an income of more than 300000 for a family of four to live comfortably in Massachusetts. Oh, wow. And that's because child care and some of the other just sort of basic expenses in that state are really high. Uh. The least expensive state was Mississippi, but even so, you would have to earn 177000 a year in Mississippi. And like you said, the wages are much lower in a state like that. The median across the U.S. was 213000 Wow. I, I didn't realize it had crept that high. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous to look at some of these numbers. Like, it just doesn't seem like anybody, really any average person would be able to earn this much. But it's also kind of an important thing to consider. The cost of everything that we need to live has far outpaced what the vast majority of people are earning. And it explains a lot of what's going on in our economy today. Yeah. Okay, I guess we should give this conversation to the station and see if we could get raises. <laughs> That's it for Booming. Do you have a question about the economy? Email us at booming at KUOW.org. As always, a special thanks to all you listeners who financially support KUOW. This show wouldn't be possible without you. If you're not a supporter yet and you want to help out, go to KUOW.org slash donate slash booming. And thank you. Our producers are Lucy Suchek and Whitney Henry Lester. Our editor is Carol Smith. I'm Monica Nicholsberg. And I'm Joshua McNichols. And we'll catch you next time.